Tonight we're here with David Troyer, whose most recent book, The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee, was a finalist for the National Book Award. He's a novelist, essayist, and journalist whose been, work has been published in Esquire Triquarterly, The Washington Post, The LA Times, and many other publications. He teaches literature and creative writing at the University of Southern California, so we are so sorry about this weather. <laughs> so, welcome. Thank you. I'm from Minnesota, so... This shouldn't come as a shock, but it, it did. <laughs> Do we need the microphones? Do we need those? Well, yeah. we're, yeah, for the recording. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know, usually I'm loud enough that they right. can hear me in the back without it, but for the sake of the recording, for the folks who couldn't be with us tonight, we'll use that. But if anybody can't hear, just give a shout. Cool. Hey, thanks, really, thanks for coming out on Valentine's Day. Um, obviously, in Chicago, it's a day of cold bodies, but warm hearts, so... Thanks for bringing your cold bodies and warm hearts here tonight. I appreciate it. So just to, you know, we're going to get started with uh, a few questions, um, and then um, you're going to read a bit, and then we're going to uh, yep. take some audience questions. Um, this morning, you spoke with a group from the American Indian Center of Chicago who work with Native youth in the area, and one of the things that you talked about was this idea of there being only one native story that non-native people wanted to hear. What is that story and how did you counter it in this book? Yeah, so, it's no accident. Hey, welcome, how you doing? No, it's all good, it's all good. Parking is not easy down here, is it? In bad traffic and wind and woe. <laughs> you know, thank you for coming. Um, and don't worry about being late. It's, it's all, it's fine. But I tell my kids, I'm like, hey, guys, you can't be late. You can't be late. I've got kids, teenagers, and whatever. And um, I said, have I ever been late, ever, in your lives, for anything, ever? And they, they're like, no. Like, exactly. I've never been late to pick you up from school, not once. Ever. And so they get so annoyed, though, because we get, and I said, I said, we're early. I said, we're not early. It's 15 minutes until we have to be there. That means we're on time. You know? <laughs> if we got there exactly on the hour, well, that'd be in time. And that's, that's different. Anyway, um, yeah, it's no accident. So we were talking this morning, yeah. and we were talking about, um, I made a, a bold, broad claim that the dominant narrative that we have for telling Indian stories, the only one that seems to have any traction or life is a tragic narrative. That's it. Um, and I stand by that bold, <laughs> broad claim. Um, and it's no accident that the best-selling book of Native American history ever published is D. Brown's Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, uh, published in 1970, the year of my birth. So it's a very important, very important year. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> and. Um, Will you? 70 was a good year. That's a good year. See? You know. And um, I think there's over 4 million copies in print. It's been translated into 17 languages. It's never been out of print. It is the single best selling book about Native history ever. And on the very first page of that book, Dee Brown says something to the effect of, this book is about the American West, a time of unparalleled greed and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and, claim, and claims for freedom made by those who already possessed it at the expense of those who did not. And I begin in 1850 and I, at the start of the Plains Indian Wars and I end in 1890, and I'm gonna quote a little more directly, where quote, the culture and civilization of the American Indian was finally destroyed, end quote. And he goes on, on page two, to say, so if you happen to travel to a contemporary Indian reservation and you happen to notice the poverty and the hopelessness and the squalor, perhaps by reading my book you will understand why. I mean, he didn't create the tragic narrative, but he certainly fed into it. And um, it's, it's pervasive. It is the narrative mode. And as we know, because we, I'm sure we all remember our Aristotle, right? Um, tragedy, of course, right? Tragedy is a drama that is posed in such a way as to 
elicit the twin feelings of pity and fear, and then, which then leads to a catharsis, an emotional sort of unburdening. And um, I find that unsatisfactory. I read D. Brown's book in 1990 when I was 20 years old um, on the 100th anniversary of the massacre at Wounded Knee, which took place in 1890 in South Dakota. And uh, didn't most of you know about the massacre at Wounded Knee? You've heard about it? You know. And um, I was really, I had really complicated feelings when I read D. Brown's book because Brown was a very sympathetic, very liberal, um, um, very solicitous writer, and he really wanted to bring attention to Native history of the West. He really, really wanted to bring that to the forefront of our understanding of the past on one hand. And so, so on one hand, I felt really lifted up by Dee Brown, but on the other hand, as you can imagine, I felt shoved in my grave with the rather premature announcement that everything was gone, everything was lost. That's not how I felt growing up at Leech Lake Reservation, where I'm from. You know, that's not the story of my tribe. And that's not the story of, you know, tribes around the country. And what always seemed to me to be true was that the astounding thing isn't the degree to which the United States government and before them other colonial powers tried to rub us out. That's not astounding. That's not even terribly interesting. What's astounding are the ways in which we've managed to survive. You know, even at Wounded Knee, I mean, between 150 and 300 people were murdered on, on that day mostly women and children. And it's, you know, I mean, it's um, understandable that we would sort of cathart, that we would feel this pity and fear and sort of this, this sort of catharsis, right, when we think about them. But then by doing that, we do not think about the many hundreds who did not die and who went on to make lives and went on to get married and have children and go to school, some of them, and not go to school for others and convert to Christianity for some of them and for others to, to sort of revitalize and to sort of stay close to their traditional ways. There were many more people who survived, right? which is not to discount the dead, but it's to remember that, and those people who survived did more than survive. They, they lived active, full, interesting lives. They, they weren't just victims of this country. Um, but there's this tendency, right? There's this tendency to sort of think of Native history as merely a, a laundry list of abuse. Um, and to think of Native people, you know, and I've heard this, I've had this said to my face, that people will admit intellectually that Native people might exist still, but not, but not really in people's minds. Not, 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 not for real, you know? And a few had people said, well, you can't be Indian. Like, Why not? Like, well, you're, you're here. No, no, no. That's been said to me, you know? Um, and I find that unsatisfactory. And so I thought about my reaction to Wounded Knee, and I've, I've been to the book, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, and it's been sitting sort of inside me, and I've been thinking about it. I'm like, there is no book about what we've been up to how we've been living, actually living, um, for the past 129 years. Um, there's no text that sort of explores how we've lived and how we continue to live. And I, I felt like there was a, a, a lack, an absence, and I wanted to write it. Um, Karl Marx, also, I'm sure, ready, ready to mind. Um, in the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, I'm sure it's History, they just don't always make it as they choose. They don't make it with, with tools of their choosing, but they make history nonetheless. I read that at the same time as I read D. Brown's book, and that seemed to me to be one of the ways I could perhaps think about what we've been up to, other than, and then merely sort of surviving as kind of little ghosts that haunt the American imagination and haunt the landscape. You know, living but not really living in most people's minds, even in our own minds, you know? And so I thought, yes, we have been making history, not always from positions of advantage, not always as we choose, but we've been making history nonetheless, and that's the story I want to tell. And so that's, all of that came together 
in what was supposed to be a much shorter book. <laughs> What did you, you know, you talked about the, you know, the need to see your own experience represented, but also what were some of the, the things that you found as you were reporting out the book that you did not expect? There's, I mean, one second. <laughs> so the book, the book ended up being a kind of melange, it's, that's what Hampton Side says, and I think it sounds really cool. Um, a melange of history and reportage and very small bit of memoir, right? It, it, it's a, it was a structural and stylistic approach that, that the material itself demanded. So I was talking about what, we, what we've been up to and so I had to go back in the historical record. Um, but I was looking at Indian life, not Indian death. And so I had to go out and talk to people and hear from them. And then I had to put myself in the book, too, because it didn't seem fair to do it otherwise. Ask people to share themselves and not risk something of myself. Just seems, I just can't do business that way. I can't do that. So, I mean, it was, every step of this was full of surprise. I mean, I'm not a historian by, by training or even by disposition. I kind of wound up writing a history in it that was not anything I'd ever aspired to. So, I mean, reading this stuff and having to understand, like, okay, like, how long did the treaty making period last? What was the first treaty? What was the last one? What, you know, like, all that, I didn't know, I didn't know that stuff, you know? Um, and then when I went out and talked to people, I learned everything. You know, there were so many surprises. I was talking to this one, I didn't even, I'd never been to Blackfeet country, I didn't have any, real Blackfeet friends, but I had Blackfeet Facebook friends. We have a really vigorous presence in social media, um, if you didn't know. You know, we used to use all the different parts of the buffalo, and now we use all the different parts of the computer. <laughs> you know. Um, so I knew this Blackfeet guy on Facebook, and I said, hey Sterling, can I come out to Montana? I told him about the book, would you help me out? And um, he said, yeah, okay, sure, I can help you out, I guess. I want to talk to people and, you know, I don't want to talk to any professional Indians. I want to talk to real people, you know, and he said, yeah, sounds legit. I said, do you know where I could stay? And he said, well, I don't know. There's no place to stay around here, but you could stay with me and my sister and her husband and their kids, if you don't mind. I'm like, okay. So I drove out to Browning and I arrive in Browning and um, I text him. I said, hey, Sterling, I'm in Browning. Where should we meet? He goes, let's meet at casinos, stupid fucking ugly building. You'll see it. And so I went to the casino and I texted him again. I said, I'm here, where are you at? He said, well, I'll be there in, t I'll be there in 20 minutes. I said, okay. And there's a pause and then he texted, and I'm gonna bring 10 of my cousins and we're gonna knock the shit out of you. So I texted him back and I said, well, I don't know. I mean, 11 black feet against one Ojibwe sounds like even odds. <laughs> bring your cousins, man, I don't care. And then he, he lolled me. He's like, this is gonna be so much fun. But I didn't know if he meant the fight or just... <laughs> The fact that we were of like mind, but yeah, he obviously didn't bring his cousins. He, he was just joking, you know. Um, but he introduced me to all these people. It was so, I mean, every bit of it was surprising. This old guy named Red Hall, he was like 83 years old, fiddle player, um, uh, former railroad worker, former Indian cowboy. And we talked for a long time. And when we first got together, he was really reticent. I mean, he, he was nervous. I could tell he was nervous. And finally he confessed. He's like, I don't know why you want to talk to me. I mean, I'm, I don't know anything. Like, I'm not an important man. And I said, but you're an expert on what it's like to be you in the 1940s and 50s. I don't know what that's like. What is it like to grow up and to try to raise a family and get married and find work as an Indian man in 1949, 1953? I don't know what that's like. And no history book can tell me what that felt like. But you can tell me what that felt like. I just want to know about that kind of stuff. He's like, oh, well, okay, I'm pretty good from 1936. I'm like, we'll start in 1936 then. And um, I learned all sorts of crazy stuff that didn't wind up in the book. He's like, well, of course, if you're making dried meat, I'm like, what, what's dried meat? He goes, well, this is what it sounds like. It's fucking dried meat. He was a crusty dude. He was really like, he was a sharp, sharp guy. 
He said, well, we didn't have refrigerators in the 1950s because we were too poor. So we didn't have electricity in most of our settlements, and so we'd have to dry meat. So you, you just cut it real thin like a sheet. There's a special way of cutting it, and you, you kind of drape it over maybe a little frame you make out of sticks, like willows or something. Let it dry in the sun. I said, do you salt it? He goes, no, we didn't have salt either. Not much of it anyway. And so you dry it, and then you just kind of crumble it up and put it in your bags, and, and then you boil it, and then you put it in soup and stew. And so, Because you can't eat fresh meat, you get the runs. You butcher, and then you eat. You eat the meat right away, you, you get sick. I was like, I didn't know any of that. You know? So... From the little to the large, I mean, I, I learned a lot. It was, it was the best part of writing the book. It was really fun. And as you were, so as you were learning these things and as you were talking to people, how did you sort of establish that, you know, you were someone who could be trusted with, the, with these stories? Well, I've reached a point where to some small degree, my reputation precedes me, mm -hmm. to a small degree, right? If I said, this, I'm so-and-so, well, they can Google so-and-so, and then they can see that I've, what I've written, they can see where I'm from, all that stuff. Um, but that helps, you know? I've already written one book of nonfiction, Res Life, which is kind of similar to Heartbeat, except that Res Life is about reservations and why they exist and when they started and what they mean and where they're going and Heartbeat is about native life more broadly, but um, I don't know. I mean, part of it too is, you know, I'm, I, feel like, I feel like I'm pretty lucky, you know. I don't present necessarily as native, at least in the ways that people think natives should look, you know, though the fact is, and any native person will tell you that we come in every shade and we come in every size and shape. You know, there is no look and there hasn't been for a long time. But, um, but having been raised in my community in, you know, at Leech Lake in my very large chaotic family, um, I just know how to I know how to relate to people in ways that I wouldn't know if I didn't if I wasn't raised like that. Um, that helped too. Like I was legit in some some undefinable way. Um, but I was also pretty clear with people too. And we talked about this this morning. But um, when I sat down with people to talk to them, I said, "Here's what we're going to do. Here's here's the book." And I kind of laid out the, the big project. And I said, "So here's." Here's how it's going to work, though. I'll, I'll record you, and we will talk. And it might be for hours. It might be for days. It just depends on if we, you know, we hit it off. And after I'm done recording you, I'll disappear probably for months, if not years, because books take a long time. But if I write a section, and if you appear in that section, I will get back in touch and you were the first and only person who will see that section. And you can, this is very unjournalistic. You, know. you can correct errors of fact. I'm gonna get things wrong. I'm gonna rely on you to help me get them right. You can rephrase anything you wished you'd said better or differently, because we'll get carried away. And if you don't like how you are being positioned inside this section or this chapter, you can opt out. Because it's not just you talking, it's gonna be me assessing what your life means. It's gonna be me sort of trying to see your life as, as sort of more than maybe, or differently than how you're used to seeing your life. Because really the book is about the ways in which history is not a dry set of details and events from the past. It, the book is really about the ways in which history, and in particular federal Indian policy, lives through us in the makeup of our character. History is expressed in our lived experience, oftentimes unconsciously. You know? So if you don't like how you're being framed, assessed, interpreted, if you just don't like how it's all going, if you think it's a, it's a bullshit kind of endeavor, 
you can opt out and I will take you 100% out of the book and if that means I have to rewrite the book, I'll rewrite the book. I said, because we've been screwed over in print so many times, because this is the situation in which Native people, we find ourselves. We are the most visible, invisible minority in this country. You know? We, even though Native people outnumber Muslims in America, even though we, we almost outnumber Jewish people in America, it's true, you wouldn't know it. And most people will go their entire lives without having any kind of sustained interaction with us ever. Most people will spend more time watching Dances with Wolves, which is like 15 million hours long, <laughs> that's science, <laughs> than they will actually having an interaction with a native person. So we are the, but we're, but we're incredibly visible in that we have been imagined to death. We are such a fundamental part of how America understands herself. We are fundamental to all the myths the country tells about itself, to itself, and yet people don't have any kind of sustained interaction with us. This is not the case with African American people in this country. This is not the case with Asian American people in this country. So other populations, it's not to say it's better or easier, it's just different. So we're the most visible and visible minority. We're everywhere in the mind, but we're n almost no place in everyone's lived lives. And if we do show up, they say things like, well, you can't be Indian. Because we don't, and we, we oftentimes refuse to act like the Indians of their imaginations, you know? Um, it makes them uncomfortable when you're sort of out of character, the character they've made for you. And so, um, that's, you know, that's a complicated situation in which to be, and I have no idea where the question started. <laughs> but where did the question start again? Uh, no, we were talking about, um, about the, the gaining credibility with the people uh, that you were interviewing and making yeah, right. them feel that they could trust you. Yeah. So we've been screwed over in print. That's what I was talking about. In print. Yeah. I mean, the, the ways we've been imagined most often are in published works, in film to some extent. But mostly, you know, people imagine us in story, in writing. You know, James Fenmore Cooper's The Pioneers was the first American bestseller, did you know? Leatherstocking, I mean, Last of the Mohicans came later. That was, a, that was a prequel that he wrote later because The Pioneers did so well. It sold something like 5,000 copies in the first week. In, at that, even now, that's a big deal. But in 18, what, 30 what? I don't remember the exact year of publication of the Pioneers. Someone could probably look it up if they had limitless knowledge at their fingertips. <laughs> you know, I mean, America's always been obsessed with us. America understands itself as different from Europe, from Europe, primarily because America has Indians and America has a frontier. France does not have that. Britain doesn't have that. Germany doesn't have that. We, we, America, by we I mean America in this context, understood itself as distinct from Europe because of us. I mean, America's first revolutionary act was to dump tea in Boston Harbor, but you know that they dressed up as Mohawk Indians to dump tea in Boston Harbor. It wasn't just, it wasn't just a regular street clothes dumping of tea. America's been obsessed with us. You know, we, we have so, we occupy so much headspace. All of the credit, but none of the credit somehow. Yeah, right? Yeah. So talking about your own family history, your mother is Native American, your father um, is a Jewish immigrant. How did they influence you as a writer? <laughs> uh, well, my mom told me not to do it. <laughs> no, she did. I gave her the draft of my first novel after I was done, and I presented it to her, and she read it, and she's like, Oh, honey, it's a terrible idea. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's brilliant, as only a 22-year-old can, you know. And she's like, no, I mean, yeah, it is, but it's just a life of disappointment and heartache. She's like, look at your dad, you know. My dad had wanted to write. He wrote. He wanted to be a novelist. He never published a novel, never could, you know. 
It's one of these cases, and it always made me very sad, that my dad was really good at a certain kind of writing. He was a great historical writer um, and a great newspaper columnist, and um, but not so good at fiction. You know? He never learned that one thing, you know, bless his heart, you know, he's gone. But, um, you know, if you do, it's sort of like actors know this, right? If you do all the feeling, then your audience has to, doesn't have to feel anything. And in writing, it's similar, too. If you do all, if the writing does all the feeling for your readers, you're, nothing's required of them. They feel nothing. He didn't quite get that memo. So it was a little overwrought, unfortunately. Um, so my mom told me not to write. My dad was supportive. Um, he was such a weird man. He, um, they, he fled, he survived the, um, survived the Holocaust and fled to the States, he wound up here eventually, um, and then rather accidentally wound up in Ohio and when he was still in high school. And um, he taught himself English by listening to the radio, so he sounded like, an, in, through his life, he never had a German accent, but he sounded like a 1940s radio announcer. He sounded like Edward R. Murrow, That's how he sounded. No matter what he was doing, you know, so he's yelling at us. He's like, David, Tony, I'm deeply disappointed. <laughs> deeply. And I'm like, is it time for the broadcast? It's time for the broadcast, <laughs> you know? And um, it was comical, and we'd start laughing. You know, and he got, that's not funny. <laughs> not at all, you know? And it was just, it was, but it was to us. Yeah. But he, um, yeah, anyway, he wound up on the reservation teaching high school English. He was a Shakespeare teacher. That's what you do, right? You take a first language German speaker and you have them teach Shakespeare to native students <laughs> on the reservation. That's how, you, that's, that's how you do it in this country. And um, yeah, he was great. And um, he died in 2016. He died actually the week I started writing this book. And so he was much on my mind when I was writing it. And he, he died of dementia and Alzheimer's. And for a guy who would sort of really had survived by his wits, to lose them was, was pretty, it was tough. It was tough. Um, we were close. And to watch him and to be with him and to take care of him. I, I lived with him as much as I could and took care of him as much as I could in his final you know, years. But it was tough to watch and tough to be around. One of the hard things is that it, for those of us who endure it, like it's sad to see them like that, but it's also incredibly boring. I don't mean that in a funny way. Like, and then you feel bad about being bored. But what happens is, of course, we all have, our, we all have tapes, right, in our heads, and the tapes that we play for people. And if we get new people in our lives, we can play the tapes, and for them it's the first time, but for the people who've been around us a lot, we, they hear them over and over and over again. But when you get Alzheimer's and dementia, well, the tapes start getting erased until you have just a few left, just a couple. And you just tell the same stories over and over and you'll stop halfway through and start at the beginning. It's, a little, it's, it's, it's exhausting, you know? And I felt bad for being exhausted. But we were eating lunch at his house and, um, you know, maybe six months before he died and I'd heard all the tapes by then, you know? And uh, I said, so, how do you stand this place? He's like, what are you talking about? I said, well, this country. It was in the throes of some stupidity at the time. I don't remember what it was. Not as stupid as it is now. Um, he didn't live to see the 2016 election, for which I'm grateful. I mean, he already went through Nixon and McCarthy. You know, he didn't need to go through that. And um, I said, yeah, but Dad, this country, like, it does so much stupid stuff. You know? And it's so disappointing, you know? And what, I was thinking to myself, you know, what Churchill had said, that America always does the right thing after it's tried everything else, <laughs> you know, didn't even seem true anymore. It just seems like we couldn't do the right thing. I said, this isn't my country of choice, this is my country of birth, and for better and worse, America has grown up on top of my tribal homeland. So to leave this country is to leave that, and I'm not prepared to do that. 
I said, but you chose this place. So how can you stand it? And I got him, you know, he, and I heard something new. He's like, what? What are you talking about? And he had this way of like looking at you like you were dumb. You know? <laughs> He's like, well, this country saved my life. It's not any more complicated than that. I mean, Austria didn't want me. Wanted to kill me. Germany wanted to kill me. Couldn't stay in Belgium. England, they didn't want me. They weren't going to let me stay. This country saved my life. He said, so how do I handle it? He goes, I don't know. Like, it saved my life, so my job is to save her life, its life. That's the job. That's the agreement. That's the deal. It saved me, so I have to spend the rest of my life trying to save it from itself. That's how it works. Because I don't know why you're even asking me this. You know, and it seems to be like simple, but it's, but that was on my mind a lot, you know, when I was writing this book in particular, like his, his belief that things can get better. He was the most pessimistic optimist, or is it the optimistic pessimist that I've ever met. Like for him, it's like, you know, the glass is half full of poison, you know. And at least you know. Yeah. And, um, or is it half empty? It's hard to say, you know, but, you know, so that was really on my mind, you know, that, um, that sentiment, that sensibility when I wrote this book was sort of very much the front of my mind. I wish Where she... Where is this conversation taking place? Though? What's that? Where is this conversation taking place? At his kitchen table while I fed him lunch. I mean, where are you? Where are, where are yeah. This is uh, on the Leech Lake Reservation in northern Minnesota. Yeah. 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 He um, moved up there in the 50s and um, met my mom eventually. And then uh, they split up when I was in my mid-20s, but he stayed. You know. There are more non-natives who live on the reservation than native people. That might come as a surprise to you. you know. And uh, for my book, Res Life, I, talk, I grabbed... I called one of my brother's friends, my younger brother. Hey, Ryan, I want to interview you for this book I'm working on. He said, well, what's the book? And I told him about the book. He said, oh, it's about reservation life and this and that. And he said, you know I'm not Indian, right? I said, no, oh, Ryan, I know. You're the whitest person I have ever met. <laughs> you glow. You've lived your entire life on the Leech Lake Reservation. You have a kind of res life, reservation life. I said, I'm interested to see how, that's, how that is, because I think that's curious. And he's like, I've never thought of myself that way. I've never even considered the fact that I lived my entire life on a reservation. It didn't even, it never occurred to me that that was a truth. I'm like, well, let's talk about what your life was like. So anyway, yeah, northern Minnesota, about eight miles, eight miles west of Cass Lake, right on the border, about seven miles east of Bemidji, right by, you know, a golf course called the Greenwood Golf Course, and they're very mean. We, we don't golf there. Um, yeah. Did you, we talked about this a little bit this morning as well, but did you grapple with the idea of identity growing up, with the idea of being Native, being American, being an immigrant? Were those things on your mind? Yeah, we did talk about that this morning. Um, not when I was a kid. You know, I tell my creative writing students all the time, I was like, look, good storytelling is not about the big ideas, all right? Good storytelling is character forward, it's plot forward. I said, your characters are going to have immediate concerns, overwhelming, pressing needs and desires that they want met. That's what's going to get them out of bed in the morning. That's going to get them to act dramatically. You know, like, there's rarely is a novel about, you know, someone walking around thinking their thoughts dramatic, although I will say that it worked for Proust. <laughs> um, I, love, I love that book. Um, but I tell my students all the time, like, your characters, like, and it, it's a little bit of a shorthand, and it's a little bit crude, but I'm like, look, your characters are concerned with getting laid and getting paid. 
I mean, not exactly, but you know what I mean. I'm like, and I had immediate and local and overwhelming concerns, like, why was my brother so mean, you know? And um, when would I be big enough to beat him up instead of him beating me up? And, um, you know, would anyone ever go on a date with me? And here I am on Valentine's Day. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so you see how that worked out. Um, I'm serious, though, like, not about that, but it, I was wrapped up in the extravagant sort of needs of my immediate life when I was a kid and sort of wondering about what I meant was not one of those things, you know? I mean, Leech Lake is a weird place anyway. My uncle, my mom's brother, my uncle Davey, um, it's my favorite uncle, he was crazy. Um, he was in the 82nd Airborne. He was a tough little guy. I think he was only like 5'5". Five, five. But he was really tough. We used to work together one summer, and he showed up at work, and his glasses were all like crooked and all taped up. I said, "Hey, uncle, what happened to your glasses?" He's like, "I don't know what happened." So I was at this bar, and this guy cold cocks me, you know, just punches me right in the face. I was like, "Oh, that sucks. What happened?" He's like, "Well, I got up and I knocked the shit out of him and his dad." <laughs> I'm like, "Huh? Okay." He's di he was he died last year. Um, and uh, he was very sick. And I was visiting him in the hospital in Bemidji. You know, his kidneys were failing, his liver was failing. He's just a mess. And we were just chit-chatting. He's like, oh, man. He was talking about Leech Lake, you know. He's like, you know, Leech Lake Reservation? He's like, that's my favorite place in the world. You know, I've been all over the world when I was in the age second airborne. I jumped out of planes all, all over the place. He's like, but Leech Lake? He's like, you can be as weird as you want. And you get to be here and you get to come home and be here. You know? And he's not wrong. And that's one of the things, too. It's like we're incredibly diverse in so many ways, not only from tribe to tribe, but from reservation to reservation and on reservations from village to village. And within those villages, just our own unique personalities. It's, there's so much diversity, you know, um, that goes unnoticed by most, I suppose. Um, so I didn't feel unlike my tribe mates, even though I looked like like Jason Statham, you know. You guys don't know who he is, do you? No. Even the, you should look him up. Excellent actor. Excellent actor, yeah. Um, lots of people look like me. I wasn't like, oh my gosh, what does it mean? You know. I mean, I felt that later. It was only when I left and I went to college in New Jersey at Princeton where I'm like, I finally had I, I was sort of surprised to learn that the rest of the world had really firm ideas about what I should be like, you know, um, that didn't conform to my ideas about how I should be like. And so, I don't know, you know. Um, I was really fortunate, you know. I, I came from, my family was really big, still is, you know, and in it, we have all sorts of ne'er-do-wells, you know, convicts and so on, um, and all sorts of cool, accomplished people, um, super dark to super light, and um, most of them really funny. And um, I felt, yeah, like I was, in, and, and it was a well-known family, you know? Like, I say, who are you? I'm like, David Troyer. They're like, my dad taught generations of students at, in the region, you know? He knew everybody. He'd worked and lived there since the 50s. He knew everybody. My mom was related to everybody. Like, oh, well, who's your mom? I'm like, well, my mom's a Sealy. They're like, oh. Like, oh, where's your, where's your family from? And I'd say, Bina. Then I'd go, oh. <laughs> you know? Anyone been to Bina? So you know. <laughs> you know, it can be a little rough. Um, and, um, you know, in my, yeah, so. As a, obviously as a uh, child of a Shakespeare teacher, you're, you know, you, you grow up surrounded by, by words and by language. Who were some of the writers, um, including native writers, that, that influenced you or that you really felt spoke to you? 
um, I hadn't read any Native writers as a kid and didn't read any in college except for one. And that, I mean, when I read Louise Erdrich, I, I read Tracks first and I was floored. I was blown away. I'd never read a book that sort of imagined the place that I was from or a place quite like it. I mean, she's, she's Ojibwe from Turtle Mountain. You know, she's writing about similar landscapes and similar communities. I'd never seen that imagined on the page by anybody. I didn't know you could make magic out of where I was from. I had no idea until she showed that I could. But I don't, I don't know that I was, I was, I remember, I remember going to, I took two creative writing classes. That's all I took as an undergraduate. I remember going to one. And I was in this European short fiction class at the same time. We were reading Flaubert, Thomas Mann, um, E.T.A. Hoffman, James Joyce. And I remember coming, I was all lathered up, and I came into my creative writing workshop, and I said, so I've got a question. And, the and I was just preposterous that I thought this was a legitimate question and that it could possibly be answered. I was like, so I've been reading you know, A Simple Heart by Flaubert, and I've been reading Tony L. Kruger by, by Thomas Mann, and The Dead by James Joyce, and I, I just, how do I, how do I do that? How do I do that? And my instructor was not very helpful. And he said, oh yes, I don't, you know, it's probably best if we don't compare ourselves to them because they're masters. And I'm like, I just, I was dumbfounded. I looked at him, I'm like, but then why are we doing this? And what's the point of any of this? If we're not going to compare ourselves to them, if we're not going to try and, and exceed them, then there's no point to any of this. Then this is just a hobby. And I'm not here because it's a hobby. I want to know what it takes to be, I don't want to write like Joyce. I want to write and have an effect similar to that. I want to have an effect similar to Mon and to Flaubert, like, I want to move people in the way that I've been moved by them. And he's like, well, you know, it's best if we don't compare. I'm like, why are you even teaching? I said, why are you teaching? I was so mad. I was so disappointed. Um, and so my influences have always been broad, you know? Um, I was moved by those writers, and I was impressed by them. And so I sort of... I was inspired by them, as I was later on by Erdrich. And then I had really good fortune. I took those two classes, and then I got to work with Toni Morrison for a year and a half um, as a student. And then we remained very close until she passed away this summer, um, this, in August. And um, I was really impressed by her, too. You know? And so. But I always felt, and we talked about that this morning, but I, I always felt that native literature is best understood as a, primarily a literature in English, which is, which is derived from both our tribal specificities, but as much or even more so informed by a world literature in English. Louise Erdrich's nearest relatives, a book's nearest relatives are other books, I think, you know, not not reality. Dickens' novels come into focus when you know Victorian literature, not because it's accurate, you know? But that's the messed up thing. Writers of color are supposed to speak about, you know, cultural truths, while white writers get to talk about universal truths. Updike writes about love, but Morrison only writes about the black experience. It's a kind of ghettoization. And I'm like, no. That is not the best way to read multicultural literature, and it's not the best way to write it, not the best way to understand it. To understand our literature, you have to understand its relationship to all sorts of other literatures. I mean, in Morrison's case, she was a classics major. To understand Morrison, you have to know Greek tragedy, and you have to know Faulkner, and you have to know Cather. And you have to know Welty, not just Langston Hughes or Richard Wright. It just seems obvious to me, you know? So 
um, my influences, I'm always, always very self-consciously like drawing from as much as I could. Um, so first Louise, in terms of native writers though, and first, first Louise, um, and then my next love affair is probably James Welch, Blackfeet writer. Um, those two, most of all. In looking at your own work, you know, you've worked in, in a number of different forms. And is there a through line through all of it? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Morrison was really funny. She said, you know, journalists are going to ask you all sorts of stupid things. <laughs> journalists are going to ask you all sorts of stupid things. Not you. Not her. No. I'm absolutely I'll not. I'll take it. No. My background's in journalism. I, I started out. I'm not talking out, about Allison. I started Allison out asks, asking people no, stupid things. No, she asks things. smart things. Occasionally, a journalist not present will ask you stupid things. And the, worst, the, the best thing you can do, if you're feeling generous, you just turn their question into the thing you actually want to answer and answer that. But if you're feeling ungenerous, you say nothing at all. Nothing unnerves a journalist as much as silence. And I've tried it. Oh, it's really fun. <laughs> really fun. Try it sometime. You know, but anyway, um, what was it again? What is the through line? Through line. I remember now. No, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, so I mentioned earlier that you know, the dominant narrative mode for, for telling Indian stories or for imagining us is tr the, tr the tragic pity and fear, catharsis, and so on. Um, the opposite of tragedy is not a story of hope, folks. A story of hope is just the other side of the tragic coin. It's as facile. It's as sort of empty and like faux virtuous as a tragedy is, and it yields the same effect, which is preserving the status quo. Because if you just emote deeply, you know, that's not the same thing as political action, just FYI. You know, reading a story about Native people, feeling all this intense emotion and sadness, and then feeling overcome by it, that's not action. That's not changing anything. That's not a politics, that's a sentiment. And I'm not in the preserving of the status quo business. So for me, and, and tragedy for us as a way of telling Native stories, tragedy just kind of turns our lives into a condition in our history into a set of like sad statistics. So to undo that, to, to the opposite of that is to tell a story of complexity, depth, nuance. As I tell my students about any kind of storytelling, our characters aren't built out of big ideas. Our characters are built out of concrete details, word after word. It's, it's you know, it's a mason's job, brick after brick after brick, word after word after word. And together, you about start building larger and larger units of meaning. But it's the specifics, it's the details that matter. So the opposite of tragedy is a story of depth and complexity and detail and nuance and contradiction because that is what it means to be human after all. Um, and that's a sensibility I probably developed as a fiction writer and it's certainly the sensibility I brought to writing nonfiction. I, I'm just I'm overjoyed when I, people are contradict themselves and, and surprise me and Remember these like just tiny bits of their lives. Um, you know, when people die, we start losing those bits, those little details, those little concrete bits, you know, those little building blocks of what made them human. It's just those start to fade, you know, and that's the sort of real death, really. So, you know, um, that's the through line for me. Before we get to, um, to a few audience questions, is there something that you'd like to read for us tonight? I don't know. We've talked so long. <laughs> do, you, do you want, I mean, yes. 
I mean, you can read on your own, I assume, right? You know how to read. Yes. But you want to hear a few words. Yes. It is that their sense of life and our sense of their lives died with them. We know next to nothing about them. Who among them was funny? Who kicked his dog? Who was unfaithful or vain or fond of sweets? The tiny, fretful, intricate details are what make us who we are. And they're lost again and again when we paint over them with the tragedy of the Indian. In this sense, the victims of Wounded Knee died twice, once at the end of a gun and again at the end of a pen. And we die too in our own minds. And this is perhaps the saddest death of all. We are so used to telling the stories of our lives and those of our tribes as tragedies, as, as necessarily diminishing lines. Once we were great, once we ruled everything, and now we rule nothing. Now we are merely ghosts that haunt the American mind. We do this so often that we deprive ourselves of the very life we yearn for. I cannot shake the belief that the ways in which we tell the story of our reality shapes that reality. The manner of telling makes the world. And I worry that if we tell the story of the past as merely or only a tragedy, we consign ourselves to a tragic future. If we insist on raging against our dependency on the United States and on modernity itself, we miss something vital. As much as our past was shaped by the whims and violence of an evolving America, America, in turn, has been shaped by us. The violence itself was certainly influenced by the shifting frontier of conflict between tribes and settlers. As America emerged from adolescence in the early 1800s, the question of how the federal government would work with and against the states it united was thrown into doubt by the Indian removals of the Southeast. The modern Supreme Court was shaped by the questions of community and obligation between the government and sovereign Indian nations through the 1970s and 80s and 90s. And sidebar, the United States Supreme Court, between the years of 1965 and 1995, heard more cases about federal Indian law than any other genre of law. More than immigration, more than reproductive rights, more than bankruptcy, more than, more than any other kind. So as America was trying to remake itself after, civil, after enduring civil rights, after enduring the, um, the Vietnam War and Watergate and the Pentagon Papers, as it tried to sort of understand itself into the 1970s and 80s, it did so largely, at least in the courts, in relation to the question of tribal sovereignty and the rights of the individual, which were very hard to reconcile. At Standing Rock, the water protesters more recently have reminded us of pressing modern questions that are fundamental not only to Indian struggles, but also to our national identity. What and who is most important? To what degree does and to what degree should the government privilege private property and corporate interests over the public good? The tribal chairman at Standing Rock, again, sidebar, the tribal chairman at Standing Rock, David Archambault III, who was a good tribal chairman, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times that said it's another case of cowboys versus Indians, and I feel very strongly that he's wrong. What we saw at Standing Rock with those pipeline protests was not cowboys versus Indians. It was a struggle over what's more important, corporate interests or the common good. And it was native people who were making that fight on behalf of all people in this country. It wasn't cowboys versus Indians. And to, to, to sort of circumscribe that conflict as such is to rob that moment of its significance and to miss the larger point. And what, after all, is the public? In order to answer these questions, I think we have to find a new way to think. Black Elk mourned that a dream died in the snow at Wounded Knee, and it is up to us to do the next thing, to dream a new one. This book is an attempt to rescue the dead from the enemy by looking beyond Wounded Knee. It is not about the heart that was buried in the cold ground of South Dakota, but rather about the heart that beats on, among the Dakota, to be sure, but also among the Diné, Comanche, Ojibwe, Seminole, Miwok, and Blackfeet, and all the other tribes around the country. And while Wounded Knee was the last major armed conflict between Indian tribes and the U.S. government, there have been many battles fought since 1890. Battles fought by Indian parents to keep their children, 
and by the children far away at boarding schools to remember and keep their families and tribes close to their hearts, battles of native leaders to defeat allotment and other destructive legislation, battles of activists to make good on the promises our leaders couldn't or wouldn't honor, battles of millions of day millions of present-day Indians to be native and modern at the same time. We are, in a sense, the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of those hundreds who survived Wounded Knee and who did what was necessary to survive at first and then bit by bit to thrive. The how of the telling shapes the what. How we see the people, their lives, their actions, and the meanings that obtain from those lives and actions shapes the present and the possible future. This book is meant to tell the story of Native lives and Native histories in such a way as to render those histories and those lives as something much more, much greater and grander than merely a catalog of pain. I've tried to catch us not in the act of dying, but rather in the radical act of living. Because at the heart of the political convulsions that now grip the lovely, trustful, dreamy, enormous country we love lies a human question. A simple one. What kind of country do we want to be? Is this government of ours one that should merely get out of the way so that America can once again be the country, in Ronald Reagan's words, where you can get rich? Or is our government meant to be the angel, avenging or otherwise, of our better nature? It has always bothered me that the very idea of paying attention to or knowing Indian history is tinged with the soft compassion of the do-gooder as a kind of voluntary community service, like, like volunteering at an after-school program. But if we treat Native stories this way, we do more than relegate Natives ourselves to history as mattering only in relation to America's deep and troubling past. We also miss the full measure of the country itself. And I believe this with all of my heart, that if you want to know America, if you want to see it for what it was and what it is, you need to look at Indian history. You cannot know this country without knowing Native American history. It is that simple. Also, another sidebar, you know. America's first revolutionary act was to dump tea in Boston Harbor, but they did so dressed as Mohawk Indians. You know, after that successful revolution, when they're looking around for what form of government we wanted to have to replace the monarchy that we were escaping, they looked to the, the Iroquois Confederacy in upstate New York for a, a model for the separation of powers. This happened again and again and again. You know, the, the first test of states' rights versus federal power was not, was not sorted out in relation to slavery. The first test was the issue of the removal of the five civilized tribes from the American Southeast. Again and again and again, America defined itself in relation to and was forced in different directions because of the actions of Native people. To understand this country, you have to know Native history. If you don't, you will not understand it. All the questions that were posed at the beginning of this country you know, remain. What is the, and what should be the furthest extent of federal power? How has the relationship between the government and the individual evolved? What are the limits of the executive to execute policy, and to what extent does that matter to us as we go about our daily lives? How do we reconcile the stated ideals of America as a country given to violent acts against communities and individuals? To what degree do we privilege enterprise over people? To what extent does the judiciary shape our understanding of our place as citizens in this country? To what extent should it? To ignore the history of Indians in America is to miss how power itself works. John Adams, writing to Thomas Jefferson in 1816, urged him to remember that, quote, power always thinks it has a great soul and vast views beyond the comprehension of the weak, end quote. If anything, the lives of natives, our struggles to and success in surviving remind us that our souls also have great power. We need to recall the mute agony of the Indian woman, her name lost to history, who was abducted by Columbus, given to his friend, sold, traded, raped, and likely consigned to the sea. We need to remember the strength and dignity of the Odo chief, Medicine Horse, who responded to the federal commissioner trying to take his land in 1873 by saying, quote, we are not children, 
We are men, and I never thought I'd be treated like a child when I made this treaty. We need to remember the anguish of the Indian father who received news of his daughter's death at Flandro Indian School in 1906. Quote, those that were there with her said she did not suffer, but passed away as one asleep. Lizzie was one of our best girls, and I'm very sorry that you could not have seen your daughter alive, for she'd grown quite a little and improved much since you let her come here with me. To remember these stories and all the others is to remain humble in power and to be called to tend to the troubled soul of the country. It is to remember that our very lives exist at the far side of policy. It is to remember the good and the bad, the personal and the social, the large and the small. It is not to capture us, per se, but to capture the details of our lives. We are, for better or worse, the body of our republic, and we need to listen to it, to that body, to hear beyond the pain and the anger beyond the decrees and policies and the eddying of public sentiments and resentments, beyond all the bombast and rhetoric, we need, to we need to hear the sound, faint at times, stronger at others, of a heartbeat going on. That's it. So, I mean, you know, we can hang. We can talk. Yes. I mean, whoa. <laughs> Government didn't make the treaties. You know, you don't make treaties with people that you're more powerful than. You can just make them do what you want, you know. The government made treaties with Indian tribes because they had to, because we were more powerful. I mean, it's a point of fact there. But um, my mom would say that the through line probably you know, your earlier question. This gets to your question. Um, my mom would probably say that the through line in my life is that I'm argumentative. You know. That the through line in my life is that I like to contradict everybody. And there's a quote by um, the French poet Mallarmé who, who said something to the effect of, if he humbles himself, I praise him. If he praises himself, I humble him until he comprehends that he is an incomprehensible monster. You know, so to that end, I've been vexing people for years. So I got a question similar to that. Um, I was overseas in France. My books are published there. And so there was a big to do for one of my books. And so someone in the audience got up, asked a similar question, and wanted me to beat up, beat up America, which you know, I love to do. But I don't want to do it for them. So I, I felt like contradicting them. I was like, well. Better to be native here than in Guatemala. Better to be native here, you know, than, I'd to, you know, than in French Guiana. Better to be native here than, you know, like, America has done some pretty awful things, but along the way, right, at every step, every step, there were always people who were urging this country and fighting really hard in numerous ways to make sure it did not. And the country grew up being forced to balance its ambitions with its ideals. One side, there's no clear winner in that fight. That fight is ongoing. You know, and inside of, and as a part of that fight, you know, it is in some ways far better to be native here than it is to be native in other places in the world. Like Perhaps, you know. I mean, the United States and Canada are, are unique. No other places in the world have reservation, have like reserved lands and treaty rights in the way that we have, you know, and that are still important and active in the law of the land to this day. Not to say it's glowing and rosy and lovely, because we all know it's not, but um, at every point, you know, even at Wounded Knee, there was an Indian agent who served the, the, um, the Great Sioux um, Reservation, as it was called before it was broken up into smaller ones named, you know, the most Im impossible name, but it's appropriate for today. His name was Valentine McGillicuddy. <laughs> if there was ever a great name, it was that. He was not a great Indian agent. Like, he did some shitty things to the people at the agency. He was not an angel. Um, he didn't always deserve his name. But as the ghost dance was ramping up, and in the days after Sitting Bull was assassinated, 
and everyone is really agitated. The government was afraid the ghost dance religion was going to cause a pan-Indian uprising on the plains, and so they, they were starting to send troops. And McGillicuddy wrote letter after letter after letter back, back to his former superiors, because he was no longer the Indian agent. He said, do not send soldiers here. Do not send weapons here. If you have weapons, they will be used. If you send soldiers, they will kill. Don't do it. Don't send them. Because we wouldn't get worried if some Jehovah's Witnesses wanted to have, you know, a big to-do. So don't worry about the ghost dance. Don't worry about, you know, they're expressing themselves in a way that is protected for all other Americans. Of course, Native people weren't citizens yet, at least not mostly. He's like, don't send weapons, violence will be the only end. Of course, he was not heeded, and weapons were sent, and violence ensued. But there were always people like him, at every step, at every moment. Um, so, you know, I don't think the story is one of merely of rapaciousness. Um, and that's not the story I tell in Heartbeat. I, we've heard that, we know that story, you know, we have. <laughs>